So we left off at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right, now, before we read verse 7 through 8, I want to explain this concerning about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So remember and recall that down here on the earth is that Vatican is burning to the ground, Revelation chapter 17 and 18. So it's being destroyed. And during that time while it's being destroyed, up in heaven we have the scenery of God and the saints enjoying the marriage supper. But there's always a question in people's mind. The question in people's mind is <laughs> the timing of the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we don't know when, uh, how long it will take, when it would take place. Some people say that it will be lasting the entire tribulation and we'll be feasting, which is why we cannot go through the tribulation. Amen. So that's, some, that's what some people argue. Uh, now this is what I propose concerning about the marriage supper of the Lamb, about when it would take place. Uh, what I believe will take place is that it's definitely during the timeline of the tribulation. It's going to take place during the timeline of the tribulation. However, what's going to happen is that afterwards, God is going to come down and then he'll be continuing the marriage supper. Now, the continuation is a possibility. I know of some Bible-believing preachers who teach that the marriage supper of the Lamb does not occur up in heaven. They believe that it will occur during the millennium. So during this timeline is the millennium where God rules for about a thousand years. Amen. So during the 1,000 year millennium. Their arguments for this is because of the book of Matthew or in other passages in scripture, Jesus says, that there are people who are able to invade the marriage feast who tried to come inside when they weren't invited to begin with. So this does not sound like going up to heaven. This sounds like something more earthly where they can invade, which is why they teach that the marriage supper of the Lamb can continue or it will begin during the millennium. Now, this is what I believe. So within eschatology, because it's such a deep doctrine, you're going to hear a lot of different viewpoints from different Bible-believing preachers. Now, mainly, we agree the main fundamentals, you know, pre-tribulation rapture, that is a must. If you don't teach that, then you're teaching heresy. Restoration of the nation of Israel, you don't teach that, you're teaching heresy. And then dispensational salvation, if you don't teach that, you're teaching false doctrine, period. So over here... What I teach concerning about the marriage supper is this, is that I cannot doubt that there are passages, it looks like the marriage supper continues on the earth. But that's my answer, is that it's continuing. And this one is going to be a theory because uh, people have different viewpoints about the marriage supper. So I'm going to give you my theory here. And we're going to get to some interesting dispensational stuff. Up over here in heaven, we know that it is divided by the frozen deep. So it is, the frozen deep is divided. That's the one that separates from the universe down to the earth. Amen. And then we know that this is called, in the Bible, we studied Revelation 4 and 5, right? Right? This is known as the sea of glass, <clears throat> which is the floor of heaven. When we go up at the rapture, you notice it's before the timeline of the tribulation. This is why we're known as pre-tribulation rapture. Remember, what does pre-tribulation mean? It means before the tribulation, pre. But we also believe in another rapture, Amen. and that is known as a post-tribulation rapture or a mid-tribulation rapture. To me, I don't, I don't care what you call it, but the point is there is a rapture in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. 
So there is another rapture, and this is going to take during the timeline of the tribulation. And this is a rapture for tribulation saints. Above, there is a judgment that is occurring. And this judgment is known as the judgment seat of Christ, where Christians will be judged for their works. And when they are judged for their works, God will determine what kind of reward they will receive. There we go. All right. So God will determine what kind of reward they will be receiving at the judgment seat of Christ. And then we got the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is my theory here. It's occurring up here. But then when Jesus Christ comes down, he continues the marriage supper. And then I believe it's a 1,000 year honeymoon during the millennium. That's what I pretty much call it. And then I also believe this, is that before the timeline of the tribulation over here, that the church, when they get raptured up to heaven, that they will be enjoying their mansions in glory for a while. I believe that there is a timeline where they will be enjoying their mansions up in heaven, And then, okay, so this is how the timing goes. And then what's going to happen is that they are going to go through the judgment seat of Christ. When they go through the judgment seat of Christ, then the wedding can occur. And then the tribulation saints, they're going to eventually join us over there when they get raptured. God's going to come down at the second advent. This is why we call this downward Arrow, second advent, meaning Jesus Christ will come down at Armageddon, judge the world, the Antichrist army, take it over and rule for a thousand years. Amen. And that's where we continue on with uh, the marriage supper and the 1,000 year honeymoon over here. Okay, that's a lot to swallow, right? So then, now that you've heard all of that, the question now is, okay, so then, can you give me the verses to explain one by one? All right, first of all, look at that passage. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. So God is saying, let us, so let's be happy, glad, and rejoice. Let's praise the Lord together. Amen. And give honor to him. We have to give honor to God because he is worthy. Here's the reason why we rejoice. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. So they're saying that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, His wedding is come. It's here. It's here. And His wife hath made herself ready. Look at that. The wife of Jesus Christ hath prepared herself. You notice that? Made herself ready. Amen. This is important to understand. So then, who is the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Now notice that the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, is the church. Hyper-dispensationalists, these are people who do not rightly divide the scriptures, but they claim to be dispensationalists. You've got to watch out for them. They, some of them teach that the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ is referring to Jews rather than the Christian church. But that is not true. Look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Notice who is the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb. That's us, the church. Okay, my fingers are not moving. Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 5 and then verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own, own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay, this is a relationship of a wife to a husband. Now look at this parallel, wife and husband. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as, see the husband and wife relationship, parallel to what? Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. 
So the husband-wife relationship is the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church. Uh, notice over here as we continue reading down, as we read verse 32, this is a great mystery, speaking of the relationship with husband and wife at verse 31. It's a mystery, but I speak concerning what? Christ and the church. It can't be plainer than that. So the Christian church is the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no doubt about that. Okay, if the church is the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says the wife at Revelation, go back to Revelation 19. What does it say? Hath made herself ready, right? All right, so she went through something to prepare herself. Now, what I apologize is I mentioned to, for you to go to Revelation 19, but I didn't tell you to keep your hand at Ephesians 5. So we're going to go back and forth with Ephesians 5 and Revelation 19 because I want to show you the comparison. So go to Ephesians 5. All right, now I'm going to go uh, through both of them back and forth. So I want you to pay, keep, keep yourself ready and pay attention how I go to the verses back and forth quickly here, all right? So Revelation 19 it says, the wife hath made herself ready. She prepared herself. That's important. She did something herself. She worked something herself. That's a work. That's an effort. See that? If you look at verse 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Okay, so to her, the church, she was granted, she was granted, given what? should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. She should be shown, appear, she arrays herself, she dresses up in fine linen, fine clothes that are clean. See, it says clean. That's opposite of unclean. All right. White. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Did you see that? These fine clothes she's arrayed in is not the righteousness of Christ. It's her own righteousness. So the Christian's own righteousness is necessary because they're doing some kind of preparation themselves, made herself ready for the wedding. Okay, so you have to use your heads now, okay? If the church, Paul says that you got to prepare, you got to prepare, you got to prepare yourself, okay? Look at Ephesians 5. Prepare yourself. Now that's a work then, see that? Fine linen equals the righteousness of saints, right? So that's definitely your own work. Amen. Saints righteousness. Okay, before I complete that out, let's look at Ephesians 5. Notice over here at verse 26, right? It's talk, uh, Remember this passage is talking about Christ in the church. Right. And then uh, it's talking about the relationship of husband and wife. Now look at this. Verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it, uh, just like clean and white, right? Revelation 19. Cleanse it with the what? Washing of water by the word. Amen. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Okay, now, keep your hand at Ephesians 5, and then put your other finger, if you have any fingers left, go to John chapter 17. John 17. So this is the righteousness of saints. Why do you think we stress so much about reading the Bible, reading the Bible? Why do you think this pastor here cannot compromise in doctrine? Why do you think God says that when you know the Bible, it's not just believing right doctrine, but living by it? We have to live according to the Word. So all this is based on the Word of God, right? Look at John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them. Ah, you remember Ephesians 5? He might sanctify to himself through the washing of water by the Word. Okay, is it the Bible that keeps us in a present sanctification, a present cleansing? Yes, because look at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. That's why we stress so much about 100% truth, right doctrine. Amen. That's why we stress so much about churches have to teach 100% truth. If they teach error, they have to be called out. They have to be fixed. Why? Because 
Our righteousness depends on it. Yeah. We have to prepare ourselves. Now, the confusion people are thinking is salvation. The salvation is founded on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own righteousness. Yeah. So notice that this sanctification process is talking about our present, current, daily sanctification. It's not talking about our past sanctification, which is based on the work of Jesus Christ. Do not mingle the work of Jesus Christ with your work. Do not mingle your righteousness with Christ's righteousness. Do not confuse and mingle your salvation with your Christian walk, with your relationship walk, your relationship status as husband and wife. See that? So it's, if we're like husband and wife, get this, okay? Salvation is like, doesn't matter how much uh, you don't, uh, the wife mistreats you, she'll still be your wife. That's the idea. So that's our salvation is secured no matter what because it's based on Christ's work, not our work. So you cannot lose salvation. However, the relationship between the two can be bad. So because uh, the wife can mistreat the husband, abuse the husband, or uh, not be fair with the husband, and so that women don't feel bad. The husband can do that too, all right? But I'm trying talking about the church with Christ, so that's why I keep using wife, okay? So no offense, ladies. So, so <laughs> okay. You're not helping, brother. Okay, so then we, we come over here with the, wi uh, the wife and the husband relationship can be sour. So that's why, uh, because the relationship can be sour, their walk can be sour, their fellowship can be sour. That's why the wife has to do her work herself, her efforts to keep the relationship level good. Right. See, so do you see a distinction now with salvation and the Christian walk? Difference with salvation and Christian fellowship. Past sanctification with present sanctification. So that's important to understand. All right, so that's what's going on. So that's why we have to live by the word of God. That's why we're called Bible believers. Did you notice that? Yep. That's why it's so important to have right doctrine. If people, don't, uh, if people water down right doctrine, then you don't have a good relationship with God. And there are people who sincerely love Jesus, love God. But let me tell you something. Uh, the Bible says if you truly love Jesus, then you'll keep his words. So that's why it's important. If you truly love Jesus Christ, you got to live by the Bible. Our worship service, our preaching, our fellowship, you notice what it's based on. It's based on the Bible. Amen. That's why it's so important to live like that. Okay, now that we all understand that fact, let's go back to Ephesians 5. <clears throat> 